We're reconvening, and it is 11.07. No final action, decision, or vote was taken while the board was in closed session. We'll move on, consider of consent items. Please let me know if you'd like to pull an item. 5A, consider and take action regarding approving board minutes from the regular meeting held on April 20th, 2017. 5B, consider and take action regarding approving monthly financial information as of April 30th, 2017. 5C, consider and take action regarding approving budget transfers or cross functions. 5D, consider and take action regarding approval of a board resolution to extend the bank depository contract with J.P. Morgan Chase Bank through June 30th, 2019. Pull, Ms. Kishon. 5E, consider and take action regarding approving request for competitive field proposal 17-24 district-wide re-roofing projects. 5F, consider and take action regarding approving request for competitive field proposal 17-33 DW Rutledge Stadium parking lot. 5G has been taken off of the agenda by administration. 5H, consider and take action regarding approving an interlocal agreement with Bear County for tax assessment and collection services. 5I, consider and take action regarding approval of payment of the district share of the cost of traffic improvements to the intersection of Evans Road and Wortham Oaks Boulevard. 5J, consider take possible action regarding approving the TEA general waiver for Judson Early College Academy. 5K, consider take action regarding approving the Judson Early College Academy school calendar for the 2017-2018 school year. 5L, consider take action regarding approving the memorandum of understanding between Judson Independent School District and Ayers Halfway House. 5M, consider take action regarding approving a memorandum of understanding with Family Services of San Antonio, Inc. concerning the Head Start program at certain campus locations. 5N, consider and take possible action regarding approving the memorandum, memorandum of understanding with Alamo Co Community College District and the University of Texas at San Antonio for college preparatory courses in math and ELA. 5O, consider and take possible action regarding approving utilization of University of Texas on-ramps, a, co a cooperative program of dual enrollment courses and high school teacher training and professional learning. 5P, consider and take possible action regarding approving the Memorandum of Understanding with Texas A&M University for the Literacy Infused Science Using Technology Innovation Opportunities. 5Q, consider and take possible action regarding approving the Memorandum of Understanding to implement the National Math and Science Initiatives College Readiness Program. 5R, local update affecting local policy second reading, FFA, FFA local student welfare, wellness, and health services. 5S, consider and take action regarding approving update to DEC local compensation and benefits leaves and absences second reading. Can I get uh, okay, we're going to be voting on 5A, 5B, 5C, 5J, 5K, 5L, 5M, 5N, 5O. 5P and 5Q and 5S. Motion, Mr. Messias, second, Mr. LaFoyle. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7 0. We will go to item 5D. Consider and take action regarding approval of board resolution to extend the bank depository contract with JP Morgan Chase Bank through June 30th, 2019. Ms. Pichon. Thank you, Madam President. Um, Dr. Montoya, I'd just like to know, are we using best practices uh, in uh, extending this bank contract? Have there been any bids yeah, out to, to you know, other depositors? Mr. Sandler, for my question, the last bid that we did for bank services was two years ago, and what TA allows is that you can do a maximum of uh, the first term is two years, and then you can extend it twice for two more years. So this is just the first extension. Um, so, and, and I did call the school districts, the ones that are not able to extend right now because their six-year time period expired. 
to kind of just see what kind of race they were bringing with them. And our contract is still better than what they want to bring with the DCF on, which is different than this one. Thank you, Mr. Alexander. Thank you. Consider take action regarding approving request for competitive sealed bid, sealed proposal 17-24, district-wide re-roofing projects. Mr. Macias. Yes, thank you. Uh, I had a couple of questions about uh, this. I know this is part of our, well, actually, it's not part of the bond. Is it part of the insurance? It's a little bit of a, uh, the majority of the bond paid with insurance proceeds, and the rest of the bond paid with well, my, my only concern is that uh, CS Advantage, uh, USA Inc. won um, all of them, I believe, for the grouping, if I'm reading this correctly. But they were so much stronger than the number two selection in terms of cost. And then the other three were incomplete bids. So my question is multiple here. Um, why do you think we received incom incomplete bids? Was it maybe something in our end? Did the vendor not understand what they needed to submit? Um, we had three of them, so I, I need a better understanding of what may have happened there. So sure. um, I can't tell you exactly why they only got part of our projects, but what I might, what they did is some of the projects were both metal roofing sections and earlier were asphalt uh, roofing sections. So they just bid on the, they only bid on the metal portions of it. And we wanted one contract that was going to be the entire roof, not just a portion of it. So that's the reason that those particular um, companies only were eliminated before it was incomplete because they didn't bid on the entire project, only on whatever I guess they specialized in. Well, it's just a concern. Um, if you have three companies that were incomplete, it, it, it just it, it smells funny. It feels like, hey, there must have been a disconnect somewhere. I mean, and I can't imagine there are only two companies that would even qualify for that kind of service. A competitive sealed bid, uh, sealed bid is designed to get the best quality bid, but we only have two people. Three other ones were incomplete, and then of the two that were in competition, one was much stronger, almost, almost 100 percent. Yeah, I mean, so you have the price of the one that won at 17 million. The second one's at 31 million at the lowest bid. So when we score them on all of these charts. They're, they're dominating, so they're going to be selected number one. My, my concern is, um, since there was a disconnect with the incomplete bids, could there have been uh, a disconnect in what the company is saying, we can do this project for you for $17 million? And um, I don't know. I'm, I'm worried about additional change orders. I'm, I'm worried about an increased price. Because at some point, that 17 million, if they do adjustments, if they're doing the work, we need to put more money into it. So now we're going to pay them a little more, which may get us closer to that 31 million. I'm just putting it out. So it just really caused me to be concerned about the process and how this was done. Is there any, anyone that could talk a little bit about how this worked out that way? Um, I, I don't get the history here. Like you to do that me. But as far as some of your concerns, and once we, these uh, particular contractors, once they're doing these projects, they're required to give us bonding. Uh, so if they happen to uh, be off target on that price, then the bonds will pick up and, and complete the projects for the price in that bond. Um, but I'll go to speak to you today. Before Victor says anything, just so I can hear it, I understand what you're saying. So the insurance is picking this. Project up, and if there are any additional needs to fund, then the bond kicks in. Not okay. our bond. The contractor, when they do work for us at this kind of level, they're required to have performance bonds to okay. make sure that they can do the work. And if they, for some reason, decide halfway, hey, we underbid this project and we have to walk away now because we're going to go bankrupt with this, or their performance bond will kick in, which is, a, which is their insurance company for them. And they will come in and ask me to come to keep it down. That's reassuring. I do like hearing that. Is that a practice that we have with all of us? Yes. Um, our bond project? Yes, when it reaches a certain dollar threshold, like it's, it's not that high dollar threshold, but it's required that, they, that the companies, they have to be licensed and bonded before they will uh, find out for our projects. Okay, so, um, all right. Yes, sir. Well, what was the question one more time? I think the main 
why uh, some of the ven- vendors only did the division complete. Correct. And what, uh, what you there was a feeling that maybe they didn't understand what they were supposed to be doing. So, what, what you stated, Mr. Lozano, is exactly correct. Some of the contractors only did the metal roof when we wanted the complete roofing. Some of the schools have both types of roofing. We have the modified or flat roofing and metal. So, they only did the metal. Um, we did have a pre proposal conference. And we have the signing sheet for that. That's on public purchase. Had a, quite a bit of a turnout. And uh, our consultant, uh, Mr. Perry, is here with ARPO. And he, he conducted the uh, pre proposal. And uh, again, we had a good turnout. He explained the uh, scope of work. And we actually walked, went to all the schools as well and walked it and had the plans. So. So they were on there with the appropriate information. Yes, so the companies that did the three that were incomplete were they part of that pre pre? Mike, did you know that? Uh, this is Mike Perry. He's our uh, roofing consultant. I can bring him up. He he uh, he, he assisted us with that. Mr. Powell said uh, we had the pre proposed plans. A lot of questions came up. They were answered in an addendum format through the bidding process. We also gave the contractors the opportunity to ask questions. Clarify anything that they may have misunderstood. So we answered everything in the addendum up to one with three addendums, previous, modified some of the drawings, everything was clear. Uh, the insurance company also reviewed these kinds of specifications, agreed that they were clear. Uh, we asked some of the contractors why, maybe that they did not quote on everything. Some of them said we have so much work we can't quote on everything. So they chose, pick and chose what they wanted to. So, Empire Roofing, RB Roofing, and LD were all part of the pre conference. Um, I just, in my opinion, we just need to get a better job of getting companies that are viable to make a competitive bid process. I appreciate everything you did do. It sounded like we did everything that we needed to do to get the strong you invited the world. The world <laughs> the well, it just looks weak when we see these incomplete bids. Right, that's all I have. Thank you. Consider and take action regarding approving request for competitive seal proposal 17 33 DW Brett Lake Stadium parking lot. Ms. Casillas. Yes, yeah, so essentially the same quick question. We have two vendors, and again, you have the Yantis company coming in at the winning bid at $1,421,000, and the next one we've got is $2.6 million. So again, you have a big disparity in a competitive process that doesn't seem quite competitive. So Yankees ends up killing in terms of points because they have the lowest rate. It just concerns me that we're not seeing a bigger spectrum in this process. And so I'm, I'm concerned. So can you talk to me a little bit about what happened here? Again, you know, and we just put these questions come out every once in a while. Um, it's just up to the vendors just what they want to charge and make profit they want to make. Um, they may be really busy, they're just trying to say, hey, if you get the job, they're going to make credit on themselves, they're going to get it right there. Those are really busy wrestling. If you look at the collaboration sheet, the rest of the points that were granted for all the rest of the categories were pretty much the same thing the companies were either one of them could do a good job for us, they both had the ability to do a good job for us. It's just that it came down exactly as you said to the points. Um, but everywhere else, I mean, they both had a very good scores, or very equal scores in many cases. So uh, it just depends again as to what that company and what their philosophy is, what their profit margin is. Yeah. And I noticed that the quality looks like it's on par, where the differential in point values is 45 points went to Yantis and only 23 points went to Pronto. 
Um, and that was essentially the difference in the scoring. And so, uh, if we're going to do this, we're going to do it competitively. I don't know what this is competitively. We advertise it in the newspaper. We put it out to the electronic uh, system where any vendor that does this work can register there. And any time that's a special to go out to anybody. I mean, like I said, anybody in the world, I mean, anybody can really get on the work for the notified that they have something on it. It just depends if they're really uh, interested in what I'm doing. But I would just think we do. And we do uh, notify how we want to have them to so we can and we have to have them as well so they can make sure that we only have two bidders and the one really wasn't even in the ballpark. So whatever it is we're doing, if it's the minimum, we're certainly not getting a bunch of people interested in doing work. I would think that there would be a lot of companies in the area that could do this type of work. Um, right, and as you all know, the government has those better rights so that they have a lot of construction work. So, a lot of companies don't want to be built until they come and all that. And it's the same thing that happened with the roofing. As long as there's still a lot of roofs that are damaged, if you just try to buy the neighborhoods and anything, even for residential properties, if they can't even get the things from So, so really as you mentioned earlier, if the answer then who really bid low on this and they secured the contract for this, if they charge more, we're not going to pay for it. They, I mean, if it comes out, it's And unless we were to do some change order because we made mistakes on the uh, then we would certainly pay more. But otherwise, now that I've come back to the board, if that was the case. Uh, but otherwise, no. I mean, if they mess up in their pricing, then it's their responsibility to their bond and things that have to pick up the difference. Okay. Um, and and um, the timeline for finishing this, I mean, DWF, which obviously needs to be completed, just remind them of the timeline of that parking lot that will be completed. Again, that was supposed to go in three phases. The first phase is start and we'll start with this process, which should be the beginning of uh, June. It'll take about 60 days for the first phase, then we'll go around to the back side over by the general or the guest side of what we're stating, and then we'll come back to that side of the market and then each one of those should be six months. Now, this is, we have a project manager or something for us, right? And they report progress to the meet company. every week with the construction companies as they go through this process. And then they'll see if we're behind on time and they're monitoring that process. Thank you. Um, I, just, I was just wondering a couple of things. Do we, first, do we ever do anything? Do we ever do anything with the Corps of Engineers? Are we allowed, are they allowed to be in on any of our work? I don't know. I, I mean, if they would bid on work, they're allowed to, as long as they meet the uh, state requirements, but I don't think we've ever received any, anything ever from the Corps of Engineers. Really? So I'm not really familiar with their process. If they were able to be to bid on any one of the work, I mean, they would definitely be one part of their registered as a vendor. But, Victor, I'm not sure if you have anything in there, you've got questions. Yeah. No, no, ma'am, I've never. No. We can go to the town and see if we're able to work, or maybe we're not allowed to work on the exclusive project, so I'm not even sure. But we've never, and I'm not sure that I've ever seen any other school groups out there. Oh, no, trust me, we work outside, just to work with it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank do that this um, is there any requirement from the board to you or whoever solicits these bids for a minimum number of bids to present to us? No, 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 no. There's no requirement. No. Okay. I, I just I'm asking because you know three would be good. Um, just just to throw that out there because um, as Mr. Macias pointed out, the difference in these bids is so vast that it's hard to tell whether the low bid is lowballing us. For the sole purpose of you know coming back and nickel and dining, or if the, this high number is just you know way over good. So, so I, I can tell you that once we issue, once the board approves this and we issue the contract to these folks, they're not allowed. They will not come back to nickel and dining. Um, the only way they can charge you more is if we actually change the scope of work. Um, and then, and, but but what, what I'm saying, you know, too, think when you think about it, if they're lowballing us and do study work. Because that, that parking lot, I mean, isn't it a little soon for it to even have to be repainted? No, it's that, that parking lot hasn't been. Right. No, no, I know it's torn up. No, what I'm saying is, look how long ago that they, they did that. Yeah. Did you remember the year that that parking lot was going on? What was the year? 2006? 2006 um, was the last time that the parking lot was done. 
Um, there are when, and when it was um, when it was the last time it was the work was done. Like, it really wasn't done to the depth that they should have done for that type of photo. Okay. So it was it was not really done at the full um, at the right the right depth of the asphalt. So the plan really is just to go ahead and go to the 15 inches of asphalt and to make sure that and make sure that we're riding the whole year traffic to different lanes so we don't have. Um, between those the big buses parked in those little asphalt, they're going to go to concrete areas um, to make sure that there's no damage. Just things like that to kind of minimize future damage on it. But okay. it has been a little while since that uh, park has been in. It wasn't redone when the school was built. Um, we got this. Yeah, and they redid the, the stadium and everything. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. Sure, no Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Uh, any opposed? Motion carry 70 will move on to 5H. Consider and take action regarding approving an interlocal agreement with Bear County for tax assessment and collection services. Motion, Mr. LaFoyle. Second, Ms. Pichon. Ms. Pichon. Um, the only thing that I wanted to bring up here is um, Dr. McCoy, when we talked about this on Tuesday night, Mr. Elizondo made mention that there was some other. Um, Things that weren't included in this total, and uh, I just would like to reiterate uh, that those things be included in the report, Mr. Elizondo, like um, all the costs of operating, all the costs of operating the office, telephone, you know, uh, whatever it is. Yes, all of, all of the support. So we, we can do that, and we don't charge it to that particular department um, because it is charged, but we can definitely do it with the square footage charge for utilities and pro rate like that. But it isn't something that's specifically charged to that department right now. That's why it's not on here. It's just a basic expenditure if you will for that event anyway. So it's, but we can definitely do some square footage calculations and, and put it in there as well. So it, it won't be, I mean, I'm sure it's not but they will be larger than that. Sure. sure. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7 0. We'll move on to item 5 R. Local update affecting local policy, second reading FFA local student work, welfare, wellness, and health services. Can I get a motion? Uh, motion, Mr. Messias. Second, Mr. LaFoyle. Mr. Messias. Yes, um, earlier, Ms. McKinney had mentioned uh, the item. This one, I believe, if I'm correct, was uh, not posted. The second reading uh, on the website, this one, some clarity on if it was posted or missed it or what may have happened there. Uh, any explanation? Based, based on, on that um, response, uh, I think maybe we should just table it for next month's meeting and then, and then go ahead and vote on it. That way we can appropriately put it on the website. And so if there's anybody that's reading it, like Ms. McKinney, she can say, I'll check it out. But if anyone else is reading it, that would be, I think, appropriate. I think uh, Mr. Lewis can look to, you know, if it's tabled, which is fine, we need to make sure it's on the website. I mean, it may have been on the website, but I'm just a fast thing. During the process that we have, as the board requested, we're going to do a first reading, so I think it'll be posted on the board's website. It was an oversight, but it wasn't posted out there. So that's fine, and we can definitely look at the board wishes. I mean, we can look for next month, we'll post it out there, and so the public can view it, and next month we'll come back and so, Dr. McCoy, do you want to pull it or do you want to just pull it out? Uh, oh, yes, we, can, we can pull it when it's later. We'll just go ahead and pull it and then make sure it's posted, you know, correctly with the wording. And then you folks at the board can come back and look at it uh, next month. And obviously, the public is going to want to review it and then we'll have it also. Yes, we'll pull it at least later. So, this is what it's Thank you. And I missed 5 I. 
consider and take action regarding approval of payments of the district share of the cost of traffic improvements to the intersection of Evans Road and Northern Oaks Boulevard. Okay. Motion, Mr. LaFoyle. Second, Mr. Shaw. Mr. Shaw. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Montoya, I would like to know what is the district share and whom are we sharing the cost away for Northern Oaks Boulevard? It's going to be approximately a little less than 100000 be a little bit less, and of course, the rest of the fees will be paid by uh, the people that are literally building um, where the most development area will be paying for the rest of it. So I think overall, if, it, if I read this correctly, it's about 420000 so we'll be paying the, the balance about 220000 So, Dr. Montoya, just for clarity, we're talking about JISD and City of San Antonio, or no, no, that is City of San Antonio, we're going to be the company. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, that's the city of the US. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. We'll move on to 6A. Consider and take possible action regarding approving the personnel report and updates, including new hires, resignations, and administrative appointments. Motion, motion Ms. LaFoyle, second, Ms. Kenoyer. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7 0. 6 B. Consider and take possible action regarding approving the following new staffing requests for one, Innovative Academy Healthcare Academy. Oh, it's on one, sorry. Innovative Academy Healthcare Career Counselor and Innovative Academy Healthcare Assistant Director. Motion, Ms. Kenoyer. Second, Mr. LaFoyle. Discussion? Ms. Pichon. Thank you. Dr. Montoya, uh, this specifies that uh, this grant is for two years. It will be for three years. The grant and the fit the bill for three years for these positions and, and the actual support project because it's going to be a system that's in high school and the present medical program that they have. So it will be done. So when the grant funding goes out, then we find we either we find jobs for these people or we tell them up front because I know historically the district has also told people under grants that. This is the length of the grant if you want to apply for it, but be aware that at a certain point when it's over, you may or may not literally have employment. And of course, we'll have to see, you know, at that point, three years from now, what's available and, and people retire and leave, and there could be other things that can also. Um, I'm sorry. Just for clarification, this, this grant um, expires in May 30th, 2018. So it really is just the next year and then and then it and then at that point but that goes down and the and those are higher they will be higher because the one year grants and the spies and then and after that it becomes a little bit more to continue to fund it or that's a good thing that's a good thing. So yes, that's a good thing. Thank you. Any other discussion? Any opposed? Motion carries seven zero. A uh, teacher, a counselor, and a director. And it's, excuse me, it says assistant director. Who's the director? Mm-hmm. Yes, Mr. Shaw, uh, this grant is going to be for Jetson High School. And at Jetson High School, we have an early college high school uh, director. So that's the reason that for this grant, we do not want to have two directors at Jetson High School, so we're having an assistant director. That's our recommendation. You already have a director at the high school. No, ma'am, we do not have a director at this time. The recommendation is going to be for the early college high schools to have some directors in. And so if we have already a director, there is no need to have a second director. So that's, that's the reason we're going to be an assistant director for this grant. Why can't we? <laughs> if you already have a director of the early contract school, why do you need another position? 
Yes, the early college directors have not been approved yet, and I don't know if that was discussed yet, but um, the reason is this grant, uh, Mr. Shaw, has very specific um, duties that the assistant director, there's staffing of internships, mentorships. Um, there's also very specific community service because it is for the health sciences programs. So the, the duties are very different for the grant requirements to make sure that we comply with what is expected. Again, this is a grant. That is not well, something that is coming in the bar to No, no. And once this grant is up, there's that possibility that this all goes away. At that time, as Dr. Montana mentioned, it will be posted as a grant funded position, and we will evaluate at the end of the grant. And then at that point, we can see if, um, what will happen. There is no guarantees after the grant is done. I also have a question, Dr. Montoya, on the salary for an assistant director. And the way the job description is written, it says um, bachelor's or master's degree for an assistant director. If the person has a bachelor's, that's a lot of money. No, 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 I'd just like to clarify that that is not an actual summary. It is an estimated at mid point. So it would be based on uh, the experience of this person and so forth. It is used as um, on the map to submit for the grant, but it is not a guaranteed summary. It could be less. 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 And this place all that also includes the benefits as well. Mm-hmm. So when the salary is taken there, the things that are going to be the main point, uh, typically it ends up being less, but we just report the main point and include benefits as well. So that's all the cost of the district. You know, Dr. Montoya, I'm, I'm very concerned about us um, being able to maintain and, and keep a lot of people that we are in the country. Again, we are being asked to approve and make a decision to direct it. Whether it's our budget or not, we're, we're, we're asking for another type of decision. Um, on the organization of trying to go into business, will these two decisions be included in one of them? Not these, because these are campus based. No, no, I was always wondering if it would be Thank you, that's all the questions. Any further discussion? Yes, um, would, would these um, positions possibly be eliminated if we don't have that funding to renew it, or are we definitely on the hook for keeping these on the no, we're not, we're not on the hook because people have told literally what fun this is. It's a grant for the years. So that's it. Okay. Now, if there's some good people that did a good job right. and it's opening the door after the grant ends, we could see what's available within other programs and see, you know, possibly how to send it. Like that. And that would be but they're told up front. You know, if you're going to apply, there's no parameters. There's no hidden agenda. Anyone else? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion passed by the two. Move on to item uh, seven discussion items and reports. Seven uh, A superintendent report construction activity. Again, uh, Dr. Fields will very briefly share a little bit of the bond the process. It's already been, as you well know, and we've shared before. It's it's kind of moving forward, so, you know, we've done a lot, so we've got to see this. Yes, sir. I, I don't want to belabor the point. We put the consulting uh, report in there uh, the board book. I would say that most of the uh, infrastructure improvements throughout the districts that you find on that facility construction report come from the 2016 and 2017 plan. So if you have any questions about anything else, so I can answer that. Thank you. 
Mr. Sean? I did not have a question about uh, the construction update, but just the superintendent report. Dr. Montoya, I, I think, I think that I mentioned to you last month that uh, when we get our weekly monthly reports, I noticed that business services wasn't going to, wasn't part of it, and I asked if business services could also be included on the calendar of updates. And the answer is yes. I know that because they were quite even to choose in that one. But all departments are asked for some reason. But yes, we can do it. Thank you, that's all. Anyone else? Okay, we'll, we'll move on to 7. 7 B's already taken place. Uh, 7 C, overall title campus report. Mr. Messages. Yes, sir. Uh, just wanted to touch base. So, in our board packet, it was not a, there was no backup information in this project because I need to be a little more specific on what I'm asking for. That's cool. This more we put it on the agenda for discussion so we can kind of start that process a little bit. But um, what I'm looking for is, uh, I guess, the most current um, breakdown of title campuses based on percentages. We've seen that report in the past, and so I wanted to kind of get an idea of where we are now. and and potentially what the recommendation would be for the next academic school year. Ms. Riley, if you come up and show that specific information, please. And thank you, Ms. Riley, for staying so long. Good evening, everyone. Um, in reference to the Taiwan campuses for next school year, uh, as we looked at the economic disadvantage percentages at the review. Um, only one campus will no longer qualify and that is masters. Um, and I gave you a hard copy of the equities numbers, right? So I'm not sure what additional information we need. For next year. And you said that, that forecast was for all the next year. Yes, um, I guess what I'm trying to get at is uh, looking at the strategic possibility of lowering our title percentage to not lose masters. I think masters is going to be right on the bubble, right? It's a small percentage of differential right? Well, masters is at 59%, and we're going to service down to 61% for next year. So 61%, they're going to be at 59%, so they're two percentage points below um, qualifying. Obviously, that's such a force to, to think about, but um, that, that's to be tough. And that's only because that's projected. I mean, they could actually get higher enrollment and economically disadvantaged at the beginning of the year, but because we're not going to give them title funding, it won't kick in. Basically, we have higher enrollment at Masters that reach that economic disadvantaged population. Will we get funding the moment they're at 61%, or is that evaluated at the end of the year? Um, they will not receive funding because the application is beyond two yeah. hundred. So, so that's sort of my. I mean, so close where I, I like to just reevaluate. Our, and we have flexibility uh, as an entity, as a district, to say let's lower the threshold to fifty nine percent. And just since I don't have the data in front of me, and if you provided the report, if we lowered it to fifty nine percent, how many campuses would that add to that list? That would just add. Just that one time. Just masters. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we obviously have within our discretion to make that adjustment. Yes. And if it's by the 30th of June, I would consider putting this back on the agenda for action so that we can discuss that. Um, my other question, though, is uh, regarding the feeder pattern um, of our title campuses, like our elementary schools and our middle schools. <laughs> and um, I wanted to have a better understanding why Wagner High School wasn't considered a title campus when the schools at elementary and middle school feed right into Wagner and Wagner not designated for any title campus. Well, historically, as a district, we have not service of high schools because of ACLB's requirement to meet AYP and put you in progress. And if they didn't, we would receive sanctions. And you may recall in years past when we had to set aside funds for SES, set aside funds for school charts. So you lose funds that go to the campuses when you fall into that category of a stage because you fail to meet the AYP. Um, so the other consideration is if we're putting those high school campuses are much larger, so if we're putting Title I funds in there, we're not having enough funds to sufficiently support the elementary campuses and the middle school campuses. 
And so, as a district, as a, what I've seen historically is that we're trying to build strong, solid foundations of the meetings at the lower level. So by the time they hit high school, they have that foundation that they need. But uh, it's a district decision. But once they hit 75 percent, we we don't have any options. We are required to service any campus that hits 75 percent. And right now, uh, Wagner is at 70.87 percent. Well, I, I have a feeling that Wagner needs the support, and if it is a strategic direction of our district not to uh, have Wagner designated as a part of campus based on our history, and I know that things have changed with AYP and all that kind of stuff, so that's good, but if it's a strategic position to do so, the kids at Wagner still need the support. And so we, we would need to find potentially other revenue streams to offer that support if it's not going to be designated title. So, yes, yes, yes. Yes. We do provide funds for our campus. We still can't go. And, and that's good to hear, but when I'm looking at the money that's going into Wagner and uh, the performance, academic performance of the institution, not um, on par with the amount of money that's going into the school, I'm a little bit concerned about are our programs working? Are we having some issues in getting you know, the, the results that we need? Wagner has a, a slew of um, disciplinary problems, um, academic, believe it or not, um, our strongest campus. And, um, and so the state comp money is great because that's a bucket of money and it's probably more than the title funding. The state comp and end up in the CCS, one of the things that we're doing and one of the reasons that we are providing state comp funds for that particular school is because we do provide uh, professional development and we do provide uh, interventions for the students during the school day. Uh, I believe I might be talking to Ms. Uh, Duhai Tappan, but she has expressed to you that having students come in after school is not easy because the students have to work. And so it's very difficult for them to come in and um, stay for tutoring after school. They do have Saturday camp. They do provide um, interventions during the day. And um, right now, if I were to look at the funds to see where they are, as far as state compact funds that we have given and state compact funds that they have spent, I can assure you, because I looked at it today, we still have some funds that have not been used. Okay. I guess um, I'm open to innovation at Wagner in terms of doing something with all of our resources. And I can assure you with the new principal there now, she is really going out of her way to really come up with different um, programs, different projects, different ways to involve the students into ensuring that they are all being successful. And I guess my, my uh, I appreciate that. That's good. Thank you. Um, I obviously want to see Wagner go uh, perform stronger, as I think we all do. And um, if we have a strategy with a title fund earmarked to elementary school, is state comp ed money also a pool of money that could conceivably be used at elementary school? Or is it only designed for high school? We use state company money for elementary school as well. Okay. Like we said before, state government money addresses the protein criteria for students have been identified as that risk. And that goes from kindergarten on to high school as well. I guess um, I'm just astounded that we're just not doing that. I know, I get, I, we're gonna, we get, it's philosophical. There's a lot of things that we need to do from experienced teachers, retention, the whole thing. But we have a lot of money out there. And um, I just want to make sure our kids are getting the adequate resources. And obviously, the next agenda item, we'll talk a little bit about tutoring. So you did mention the word tutoring. But uh, more resources in terms of providing instructional support, um, emotional support for uh, students that are at risk and economically disadvantaged. I think the instructional support, you really hit it on the head. And I think it's an area that you're already looking at, and that is teaching attention. Because that's usually, it's a, it's a very difficult area to work. Uh, the whole uh, area of Wagner and Peter Pepper, mm -hmm. uh, it is a very difficult and challenging situation. Our students come with um, challenging uh, situations at home and in the neighborhood. And so 
as we look and as we've been looking at meeting with them and the cabinet meetings and the chat meetings, we've really discussed what other um, support can you provide for schools that address teachers, and we do provide funds for them as well. But we really want to make sure that we are providing as much support for those campuses as we can. Well, thank you for the report right now. Our husband is going to make sure that we are providing the resources. Ultimately, that's why we're looking for the funding. I want to understand the rationale why Wagner wasn't under that umbrella of public funding. Uh, and then I'll also know that um, that is more efficient. And so certain practices that we put in place are aiming towards that. But um, we just need to do our best. So thank you for that. Thank you. Ms. Wright. Ms. Wright, can we go back to Masters? Oh, yes. Yes. Because yes. yes. I know they went down. Did you also, I know I saw it from one of our packets, did you also provide us a list of the percent of free and reduced lunch applications that were collected? Yes, ma'am. And do you happen to have that with you? Because I believe Masters is one of the lowest. I do not have that with me. Okay. I mean, because we need to really make, and I, I know I mentioned that before, when I saw that Masters was coming off the title list and then they also picked up very few free and reduced lunch applications, that, that is, I mean, those are correlated. Absolutely. And so we want to make sure that we encourage our principals once again to please try to get 100% back. And I know it's difficult, but that is what we need to do because it helps us with everyone. And then with regards to high schools, um, I know Mr. Mercedes has mentioned what other funding do high schools have. They all have the high school allotment, which is not available for middle school and elementary. And so they do have a, an additional funding source. Correct. And the high schools get a significant amount of state funding. Correct. Um, both discretionary and those uh, funds that are supported at TEs much more than other states. Dr. Thank you. I probably would like them to see what that state content money is going to find our high schools. Where are we putting those resources? I think we better understand it. Yeah, maybe that's uh, kind of a chart that was shared with the board on Friday newsletter to try to a breakdown of specifics. Okay, now, show you three Any further discussion on 7C? 7D, dis review of district-wide tutoring initiatives? Thank you. Um, just briefly, I know it's late, so I'm going to try to get to my seat. Real quick, what does our tutoring look like? It looks like I've been trying to go to campuses asking uh, different principals about their tutoring programs and support. And so I'm getting a lot of different responses. So it, it, I just want to know if we have any alignment in it, if it's, if it's all decentralized. And so that's sort of what I want to have a better understanding of what's happening. And then based on the data, that's how they determine what kind of tutoring they will be providing for the students, depending on where they're needed the most. So we really can't say all of us are going to be teaching this particular uh, standard or this particular skill. It all varies depending on how the students are doing at that particular campus. Now, we do look into the number of students that are being tutored. And uh, Ms. Wadi does go visit the campuses that uh, offer after school tutoring. And we do uh, have the students sign in. And we have looked at the data of those students that have signed in and how they're doing uh, with their scores. So we do look at all that data to determine the success of our um, tutoring programs in the district. I guess one of them, um, my objectives regarding tutoring and instructional support is that um, uh, kids come out of uh, each grade at, at grade levels. And so it's, it's, it's expect, I think, an expectation that the community has. Our kids are at grade level. So when we look at elementary and we go through the system, I'm hearing that a lot of our kids are not at grade level in certain areas. And so if we have tutoring or intervention, why aren't we utilizing it to get our kids to grade level prior to the conclusion of the year? Uh, I see that as a weakness. 
one of the things that we're doing as we've started looking at this work from the CMA department is that uh, in conversation with Ms. Hernandez, one of the areas that we've noticed where our students are really lagging behind is in reading. Yeah. So we're looking at providing reading for our KK 1 and 2 only on reading um, strategies and from awareness, making sure that they're they have a strong foundation in reading before they move on to math and science and social studies and other things. I think the report that will actually tell the board where uh, our kids are in terms of reading. Absolutely, we already have that. We have it available. Is that something that can be shared with the board? I'd like to really get an idea of what that percentage looks like. If it's 10 percent of our students that are off, 15, 20, I, I don't know. But I do know that uh, if we get our kids to grade level, that when they get to each grade, they may be more engaged. Um, you know, third grade or going to fourth grade, it's still reading at a third grade level could be a problem. And we start getting that disconnect and it gets wider as time goes. So if we're committed to getting kids to grade level and putting in instructional support, I think we'll do that. No, you're absolutely correct. We, we do have to start teaching our students how to read in the earlier grade levels so that when they do move on to third and fourth grade levels, and it's not being a former ELA person can uh, you know, tell you. So we're we just starting these ELA strategies this year? Well, when we looked at the data, Mm-hmm. That's when uh, Ms. Amanda said this is a direction that she wants to take as a CMI person. Uh, and the reason I asked if we were starting is because I know that Ms. Amanda just started. So that's, 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 that was her. Yes, yeah, so she just says that we're just starting. No, no, it. Well, I'm no, just no. trying to get that understanding. No, uh, you know, each person that comes in has their own idea and own uh, mind as to what focus they want to keep, they want to stay on. A piece of members came in, she said she wanted to focus on reading at the primary grades. And with that, she assures us that that will help us improve our reading scores overall. Mr. Macias, if I may, to answer the question and elaborate a little bit more on that. Uh, the strategies and tutoring and intervention is not something that just started now. I think the focus is. Um, we took this in the direction and some guidance from this and but there has always been tutoring and strategies and plans. I acknowledge that. The only correction that I was saying, you know, the only um, change that we're making is that this year we've always done English and math at the primary grades for RTI intervention, and this time she only wants to focus on reading first. And then move on to other areas. So I see math will suffer then. No, math are doing very well in math. Uh, I saw the scores, but yeah. obviously we're doing very well math. in math. Yeah. In the primary yeah. yeah. grades, yes. I that. There's been a plus in that. Yes. I guess just think about this as I keep thinking about it myself. I honestly want our kids to be at grade level. Let's just get them to grade level, each grade, and so when we see that percentage, I want to see that narrowed over time. Because at this point, I I have to question our practices. Are they efficient? Or, and I'll be questioning all of them because that's how we measure what we're doing. Mm-hmm. And so I'll be, I'll be looking at that. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Yes. Just very briefly, Mr. Macias, the other thing is that we really think about it. You know, the teacher has to want to do the tutoring. And it depends on the number of students that are going to sign up for it. I'm glad you mentioned it. Just one second, because it's, just, it's relevant to what Ms. Kassala mentioned. Uh, one other thing that I wanted to you know, discuss is the option of bringing in um, fresh students, not half teachers who have worked already a long day, and look at retirees. Look at a, another group that can come in and provide that tutoring after hours or before hours or on weekends, because we do need to bring a contingent, which of course. It's a program that's going to take resources, but I think if we need to do that to get our kids to that level, we need to figure out how to do that. It's hard to motivate a teacher that's, that's been exhausted and probably been working all, basically all day. So, so. And now we have Mr. Murphy as the students. You know, we have students here all day long, and then you get them at the end of the day, you, you speak of the, the teacher, but the students as well. And so, what research says is that we have to provide. Um, Interventions within the school day, 
Yes, and so and back to what um, what Dr. Gantu and and Ms. Bear was speaking to is, you know, what you're saying is that it's correct. We, we all want our children to be on great level. We all do. And so what we're going to be focusing on is, is early literacy in, in, in pre-tender to second grade. Because if you look at the data, because we say we all look at the data, you know, we're just in many schools in the state of Texas, we have a high retention rate in first grade. And then you go into second grade and your gap keeps getting bigger and bigger. And so we're going to look, we are being very effective, Mr. Massey, as a board members, on all of our practices. We're evaluating all of our programs. And we all want what's best for our children. And, and Mr. Shaw had another one very well, Mr. Shaw. You know, you talk about the teachers. You know, we all have a responsibility and we all are part of this, this big vision and mission. And it's going to take a lot of work. And it's going to be a lot of changing of mindsets and a lot of forward thinking. And I'm telling you that we have a lot of wonderful teachers here. We have to do a better job in coaching up our, our teachers, our specialists, everyone. We all need to be coached up. And so it's, it's a process that we all want the end result. And the end result is all of our children are college and career ready. Yes. But they have to be able to read the gymnasium, to do science and social studies. And so, again, we're going to, be a, we're going to bring in a big emphasis on on phonics, the five components of reading, laying that solid foundation. And then you begin your processing skills and your comprehension. So we, we're all in the same page as far as that. I just want to make that comment. Thank you. Thank you for that, Ms. Hernandez. Um, as a reading, writing person myself, I know that at one time we had a very strong emphasis on phonics in the primary degrees. And um, we had a fabulous program. Um, it was uh, perhaps dropped um, after I left, and we've seen some results that, that suffer because of that lack of emphasis on science in the primary grades. And um, I personally will hardly agree. Uh, we got to make them read, and the, the math skills that they do in the primary grades um, are ones that build, and if we do it correctly, where we're building with the concrete before moving to the abstract, <laughs> then we know that those kids will be successful later on. They'll have a full understanding of those concrete concepts so that they can move to those higher and more difficult um, issues that happen at the middle grade. So, thank you for that. I appreciate that. And I'm hoping we find a really good phonics program that the, the teachers can use and implement um, that works well. Thank you. And also, um, we have to keep in mind that, you know, we're talking about after school weekends and stuff, things like that. We're talking about parental involvement. And we have a difficult time as it is trying to get parents to just sit down and uh, sign off that the kids did their homework. Those folders go home and they come back and you may, you're lucky if you, you get a kid in your room that has it signed off on every day. You're lucky. So you, you're talking about parental involvement as well as, you know, bringing, you might bring in first people at the end of the day to work with the students, but are the parents willing to come and later, to, an hour later, to pick little Johnny and Susie up from school. So, you know, there are other factors that we have to look at. It's a great idea, but we have to figure out how to, as the teachers are already doing, incorporating it into the day while they're there. My grandson um, that went through Judson, although he was special needs, I was so, so happy to see their inclusive classes but he had times during the school day, twice a day, where once he's, he was pulled out to be tutored in math, and at another time he was pulled out to be tutored in reading, and then he'd go back to his classroom. Something I'm sure you all are already doing to that effect. I went through the Judson school system for my student teaching, for my master's degree in education, so I know that they're doing it. I saw it myself. So kudos to you all for doing a great job. You just Yes, ma'am, Ms. Curry. Um, also, I want to, to make sure, Mr. and Mrs., that you understand that um, federal law regarding um, RTI requires that those interventions be um, given to the student by a highly qualified individual. So it can't necessarily, for those students who are in stage two and three um, intervention, can't be someone just volunteering. So it would have to be somebody who qualifies for that, too. So there are some regulations that we would have to work around that actual tutoring, extra help that's not part of the intervention program, absolutely that could work. 
and move on to 7E, update on professional development survey, Ms. Macias. Dr. Matoya, the survey that went out to teachers in October 2016, what have we done in terms of uh, that survey? How would you respond to it? In a very, very quickly, we did get input from numerous teachers in the district, of which one of the surprising findings, when you read it, was that it wasn't just academic concerns, but classroom management. We stood out there. Numerous teachers in the district wanted help. We've been working with Ms. Uh, Hernandez to develop a program here, and literally, as teachers come back in August, there'll be very specific, very targeted training in some of the areas that the majority of the teachers asked for help, of which one area was to help us with classroom management and how to do that better in the classrooms. But I don't know, Ms. Hernandez, if you want to share anything on that? Yes, sir. Um, the survey did go out in October, and there has been a timeline and it's been staff development already conducted. We are also, and, and the, there are actually what we call the top five, and the top five were differential instruction, integrating technology in the classroom, classroom management, and culture sensitivity, as well as lesson planning delivery. And we are well aware that, you know, when we talk about classroom management, when we're going to have classroom management is when we, as teachers, our planning. We have to spend a lot of times planning for bell to bell instruction. And we talk about, you know, what is the process that goes on in a day to day basis. And so we're going to be hitting all of those elements. And it's just not one piece. They all they all work simultaneously. And, and and if we believe that, you know, when we go into a classroom and teachers again are very well prepared, our students are going to be engaged. And that is going to help with the classroom management. And we know that, you know, based on the experiences that we have and based on what we see in the classroom. But we do have a very, very well planned. Um, right now, we were looking at next year as far as the beginning of the school year. We're going to have best practices conference and non negotiable conference. Everything's going to be very specific for teachers. We want our teachers, when they come to training, that there is a purpose. Not only the purpose, they can turn around right away and implement. You know, it's not a sitting gift. We're going to go and we're going to learn, we're going to create, and we'll go back to that class and we're going to be able to implement and implement correctly. And, and our job is to make sure that we monitor and then we have ongoing staff development. So that is key. We can't just say, well, we're only going to do it in the beginning of the year. No, sir. We're going to continue. It's going to be spiraling. And something else that we're going to also hone into is helping our instructional professionals as well. They need continuous training as well because they work with all of our, our especially our special popul population children. And, and if you go get our, our summer school programs, the children that attend those programs are going to be our lead population, our special lead population, and our kids who are behind grade level. And so we have to make sure that what we're doing for all students is very, very purposeful because what it's, the research states is 80%, 80% is what we do every day. And we shouldn't have a lot of, if we're doing our job every day, then we shouldn't have too many kids, 50% of our kids being pulled for tier two and then going to tier three. And so again, it's going to be very, very purposeful. It's going to be ongoing. And so we're going to be doing a lot of coaching up and heavy in the fall. We need to be heavy in the fall as far as training. And something that was mentioned is we don't want to take teachers out of the classroom. We're going to be providing training um, at the schools. We're going to make sure that our, our coaches, our academic deans can do it in the POC. We have to be very, very creative. And some of the documents that continues to tell us over and over, we have to think outside the box. And we have to be innovative, yes. But again, it's all about making sure that our teachers have the tools of that toolbox. And not only our teachers, it has to be our leadership. What are we doing to help our, help our principals be those instructional leaders when they're in the class and they know what engagement truly is? And it's authentic. So, I mean, we have a lot of planning going on right now, a lot of going on for all of us. It's not just teachers, it's, it's administrators, it's us as leadership, as cabinet, so we can all speak the same language. And the language is that our students are going to be successful in it. Thank you. Yes, ma'am, we have it. And we can give it to Dr. Okay, thank you. Well, Dr. McClain, that sounded great as a response. So, thank you. Any further discussion? 
We move on to 7F update on board advisory committees. Does anyone have any updates? No? Okay. 7G update on board training conferences, events, and consider future agenda items requested by board members. Ms. Kenoya? I don't have anything. Okay. Ms. LaFoyle? Mr. Macias? Ms. Eaton? At this time, I'm, I'm looking forward to some guidance for the, uh, the training that's coming up for us. Perfect. Thank you, Ms. Crystal. Yes, uh, I would like to um, ask request for some things to be on the Jane agenda. I would, because we are talking about classroom management. And, what we can do to help our students. I would like to know is it possible for us to have that, uh, that group that uh, used to be at Mexico Middle School communities and schools to give us a presentation? The answer is yes. We can invite them and we can invite some members of the work that now we get in touch with them in the next couple of days. The answer is yes. Okay, also, uh, I called you about something that was a concern to me, but I would like to know if you feel like this should be an agenda item or if it's just something that you can answer. And that was about bilingual, um, excuse me, for so those Spanish speakers who translate. Whether it be district office or any of the other campuses, do we have designated people that translate and do they get compensated for translating? And again, I think you have to view that from two perspectives. We have at the district level a couple of people that do get compensated with a document that is distributed across the district. The issue becomes in a particular school, if a parent comes in with a possible as an example, speak English, yes, is there somebody maybe in the area that can be called, hopefully in the office of the area, not pulled out of class to come and, and, and interpret or translate, etc. That one, there's no stipend or anything. And I know Mr. Arizona, we talked a little bit about that idea. We did not think that. And, you know, our, our philosophy has always been that. If you um, are able to speak Spanish and there is one of our parents or anybody else who wants to be speaking Spanish help and they need to be spoken to Spanish, then we, that's our responsibility to speak to them in Spanish to make sure that they, we help them with whatever they need. Um, I know I do that a lot and I just, I don't expect conversation for that. I just, it's just part of my job as being an employee. We've got some school district in our community and we're working for the district in this house. Um, if the board wants to take it as a philosophy of that, um, we can definitely do that, but I, I think that in my office it happens all the time, um, and we just expect to have that and help with some of the needs that kind of translation. Uh, to make sure that the customers are coming in with that teacher's words and needs are uh, needs are met, and uh, they don't speak English or they're having difficulty because maybe they speak a little bit of English but not enough to really communicate what they really um, are trying to accomplish. Thank you. I'm I just would like to at least have it as an agenda item to see what the impetus is about that. I mean, it might just be a question. Well, we, we can put it down. In fact, we might look at, you know, when I say it campus by campus to see what our populations are and possibly, you know, monolingual students because maybe the parents only speak, you know, Spanish or maybe English. We can probably create something <laughs> Thank you. Uh, when are we going to? Um, this might be a little premature. When are we going to be discussing the things for this When are we going to discuss financial advisors? 
for this evening from the Jesus. Are we going to just go to the front of the people and help them? I know we've been talking about it this time, so we have been discussing it. Um, I couldn't really really answer the question yet because we're not sure as to when the project's going to start. The new, uh, because we're going to do some design work first for the new, for veterans and veterans and things like next phase. So we have to look at the interest rates a little bit and see what the timing is for that. But we will be discussing that within the next few weeks um, to kind of get a game plan going for when that's going to happen soon, and then we'll decide about that phase during that time. Okay, so that's coming up. Yes, sir. Thank you. The only thing I'd like to add is that we need, I'm, I'm sure we've already contacted Ms. Holmes for SLI. I know all the new members have been so much. And so that's excellent. Okay, it's not that good. So I know that's coming up in June. Anyone else? We will move on to 9 9 and. What's the beginning? Consider take possible action regarding personnel. Motion, Ms. Fenoyer, second, Mr. McCoy. Um, all those in favor? Oh, any opposed? Motion carries 6 0. Um, 9B, consider take possible action regarding EEOC charge filed by the campus administrator. Motion, Ms. Pichon. Second to that item. Okay. <laughs> okay, so that, right? That item, that is right. Um, 9C, consider any possible action regarding legal and procedural issues related to proposed non renewal of a term contract teacher. I move that it, the non renewal hearing be conducted by the board and that non under be selected as counsel to advise and assist the board in connection with the non renewal hearing. I further move to authorize the counsel selected to advise and assist the board president to invoke any procedural rules deemed appropriate to facilitate any non renewal hearing heard by the board. I further move that the hearing be held at 8 a.m. on June 2nd, 2017. I have a motion by Mr. Rasmus, second by Mr. Shaw. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, any opposed? Motion carries 6 0. 9D, consider and take possible action regarding pending litigation and settlement offer regarding cause number 516CB00832 XR, Alton Crane versus Judson Independent School District in the United States District Court for the Western District of Texas, San Antonio Division. Division. Final motion. No motion, the item dies. We'll move on to 9E. Consider to possible action regarding pending litigation. I move the board authorize the administration to proceed with the settlement regarding pending litigation with Bush's Chicken and Daptronics as, as described in closed session. I have a motion, Ms. Penoyer. Second, Ms. Pashal. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7 0. And we will adjourn at 12.20 on Friday morning. <laughs>